Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday to join us here on the uh, closing ceremony for the Future of Work mini course. Uh, I know not everyone here uh, participated in the mini course, but we're really excited to make this open to uh, a broader audience. And we believe that all of you will benefit from a bit of the flavor of what the mini course looked like, uh, but now uh, broadened up with some new speakers. Um, I quickly wanted to go over you know, the mini course itself um, and then you'll know, have a light conversation with Dan, ask a few questions about the future of work uh, after that. But I want to give a big shout out, uh, of course, to Dreamplex for helping co-organize this event um, and putting a lot of effort into making this possible uh, with in partnership with Fulbright University of Vietnam, uh, where I am from. Uh, and it was, you know, a, a big effort, joint effort between two organizations, inviting also uh, four really awesome uh, expert practitioners to give us a taste about the future of work from different angles. We were able to uh, work with VNG, uh, Abhishek from VNG, um, G. I. Lian from uh, AIA, uh, Warren Eng from uh, Leaders Create Leaders, and Taiwan Lin from uh, the TVL group. Uh, all of these individuals combined create a comprehensive look at what the future work can look like uh, for participants, organizations, for themselves, and also for the future of Vietnam. And this idea came about because both Dreamplex and Fulbright are really focused on the future of work, although uh, from slightly different angles. Uh, and I think this is the unique part. Uh, Fulbright, as you might know, is a university and Dreamplex is a co-working space. And how might these two organizations be uh, brought together? It's through the idea of um, the future of work. The university is thinking about how do we best prepare our students, aka the future of Vietnam, for what the future of work looks like through a transformative and powerful liberal arts education. So we're asking the question a lot, okay, so what experiences do students need? What type of exposure do they need? What type of skills development do they need? Um, and how can we make sure that they're prepared for a, a VUCA world or a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world? So those are the questions swirling around in my head. Um, and when I'm thinking about the future of work and of course what that means for our, our university. Um, and then of course, uh, Dreamplex is also thinking about the future of work from saying, hey, we're realizing that uh, employees are, driving the future of work, you know, where do they want to work? How does that workspace look like? Um, what does happiness mean for us? Um, what are the benefits and experiences that we want to get out of uh, working with our organizations? And of course, how can a co-working space become more than just a place to work? How can we take that from organizations and say, you know what, we can act this really well. Um, why don't we, you know, take the employee experience side of things and let you focus on building your products and your organization, and then we'll have this side uh, managed um, and it's been really great to get to combine these really interesting ideas. I think a really big part about uh, the liberal arts is to think critically. And, you know, in a way, myself and Dan get to think critically and creatively about the future of work all the time. Uh, we're chit-chatting on LinkedIn a lot. Uh, Dan is always very active with sharing resources uh, about what the future of work can look like as well. So it's been really great to have this partnership uh, with Dan and with the Dreamplex team uh, for, for a, over a year now. And I wanted to actually hand over the mic now and ask Dan, two questions to share with the audience today, uh, as I shared a little bit myself. Uh, Dan, you know, can you tell us a little bit of what the future of work means to you uh, and to Dreamplex? And can you tell us a little bit more about the motivation for you to partner with Fulbright on creating this mini course? Uh, sure, uh, thanks Vincent for, I, I think you've actually already explained it perfectly and uh, probably the best uh, kind of explanation of what we do. Uh, and also, good morning to everyone. Uh, thank you for taking the time on this very early Saturday morning to join us. So our motivation, yeah, is, is, is kind of simple in a way, but uh, simple yet complex. Um, if we kind of go back to uh, ancient times, 2016, when we first started, uh, our founder, Tin, founded uh, Dreamplex with the idea to create a space, like a physical space for kind of startups to come together and to work together and to maybe meet investors and, and kind of like build from there. Um, and as that became quite a popular space, he opened a second one and eventually thought, hey, maybe we need to really build this out and make it its own company and with its own team to run it. And uh, the, more, the more spaces we opened, we currently have five locations. We are probably launching two or three new locations this year. The more spaces we opened and the more we're kind of, kind of like practicing, you know, running these like engaging workplaces, we kind of realize that it's really not the space that is the special thing that we offer. It's really creating an experience where employees, people uh, love to come to, which is typically the opposite of a traditional office where you have to come to because your boss tells you so. 
I know there's a lot of HR people on the call, so I, I can say that, right? Um, it's, it's a place that people are told to come rather than want to come. Um, and so that's really why we've been thinking about, okay, how can we actually do what I think our team, you know, we have about 40 people designing and delivering workplace experiences. How can we take what we're really passionate about, which is to, you know, create something that people love coming to. And that's a combination of, of course, um, design, physical space design, but it's also um, hospitality and community management and really engaging programming that people feel there's always something exciting to do. Like I walked into one of our spaces this week and there was like a VR thing going on. So I, I, I transported myself into the metaverse. Um, and, and especially now that we're in hybrid work mode where we maybe only see our employees two or three days per week. Um, you know, how do we, how do we manage that? How do we sort of like keep the connection with people? Um, so that's really where we've been focusing. And so in, in, in order to, to keep innovating and to keep building spaces, but experiences that maybe transcend space, um, we have to think about what's next, right? What is the future of work? And uh, I'm sure that if we would do a poll here, uh, which we won't do, but if we would do a poll here with everyone on the call who is either in an HR or leadership job and we would ask them, has managing uh, and engaging your employees become harder or easier in the last year? Then I probably think that most people would say it's become a lot harder. Um, and that's really where we want to support. But again, we can only support if we deeply understand who are the people in our workspaces and in our hybrid workforces, um, who are the basically the Gen Zs of this world that are going to take over very soon. Uh, what do they want from their workplace? And again, like how is that going to evolve, right? So now we're thinking, that's why I'm, I'm excited that Valerie is here, thinking a lot about, you know, what's going to come after hybrid work, right? What's going to be the next thing for companies to really think about when people maybe can work from anywhere and it becomes even more than hybrid, it becomes liquid and distributed and democratized. So that's why we're always thinking about the future. We live kind of one, one foot into the present and one foot into at least a year out. Um, and that's why we've been really excited to do this uh, partnership with Vincent and, uh, and the Fulbright team um, to look at it from both sides. And, and again, we both really focus on the people, right? The employees. Um, and that's what we, what we design for, whether it's academic, uh, um, you know, university years or, or spaces and experiences. So um, that's a bit from, uh, from my side, yeah. Great. Thanks so much for sharing, Dan. Um, I think we're going to move on to the next part of our ceremony here, um, which is over to the uh, really exciting panel discussion. Uh, so can I move over to the next slide, please, Mia? Great. And then I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic over to my colleague, Lynn, uh, who is the Future of Work Architect for Fulbright University of Vietnam. And uh, that is our very, uh, you know, vocal way to say that the university is thinking about the future of work uh, through this position and Lynn's role here. I'll have Lynn introduce herself further. Thanks, Vincent. I'm sharing my screen, so it might not be able to, it might, might not be able to see me on the camera. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Lynn. I'm the future of work architect at Fulbright University, Vietnam, and it is my absolute honor to be moderate the panel discussion today on the future of work in 2022. It is also my honor to introduce our guest speakers, our panelists today, uh, I have all the panelists to introduce themselves uh, quickly. Let's begin with Sakshi and then Alex and then Valerie. Hi, good morning, everybody. And thank you for having me here. Uh, quick introduction. I have worked in the HR field for the last 16 years across uh, different countries, mostly around uh, Asia Pacific. Uh, my last 10 years was spent in uh, scaling tech companies, starting from Amazon across uh, India, North America, and Singapore, and then Kupang in South Korea, basically working with uh, China teams and uh, North America teams. And recently, before I started Startup Boy with uh, Tiki for three years, where I was a chief people officer, uh, Startup Boy was started, founded by me, just on the concept of that the future of work is changing. We will see the networks and communities merging, the concept of having friends at work and having uh, personal friends is going to be a different meaning altogether. So very excited to be here to have that discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good morning, everyone. Let me start with a small apology because I have a throat infection and my voice sounds like I've been singing loud karaoke with my colleagues last night, which I wish was true, but uh, I'm a bit hoarse, but this is not my, my typical uh, voice. Sorry for that. 
Um, I'm Alex. I've been in Vietnam for the last three years, been with Heineken for 24 years. Um, super excited to be here in Vietnam now. Uh, things are moving at such an inspiring pace. So really great place to work, I should say, and excited to be part of this panel. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Valerie. Um, I represent um, Ventura Capital, uh, an early stage venture capital firm headquartered in Jakarta, Indonesia. Um, I started out my career as a consultant uh, and now have been doing um, venture capital investing for the last uh, almost two years. Um, even though I don't have um, direct experience as a HR pers uh, professional, um, I manage 10 different startups in Vietnam, both Web2 and Web3 sectors. Uh, so I believe I can add something meaningful and valuable to the panel today here. Thank you everyone for your introduction. And without further ado, let's jump straight into the panel's discussion today. So uh, let's talk about the future of work is the main theme for the discussion today. Uh, as you all know, it is multifaceted with drastic changes in job, job quality, social protection, and it is driven by a multitude of mega trends and crises like technological advancement, demographic changes, climate change, and of course the COVID-19 pandemic. Which aspects of the future work have been most visible in your organization in 2021? And I would love to hear from Sakshi first from the startup perspective, and then Alex from the corporate world, uh, an established uh, corporate perspective, and then Valerie from the venture capital uh, side point of view. Uh, so I would uh, start by saying that I spent the first half in Tiki and the second half in building Startup Boy. So Startup Boy was basically built remotely. I only met people, now we are 20 people, I only met them about four weeks ago in person. So I haven't met a lot of them yet. So I can clearly relate to the trends of how, uh, you know, the talent has been transitioning. One very clear trend, which I see just not in Vietnam, but across the region or probably across globally, is we need to engage talent more in terms of deliverables. We need to engage talent more, not in terms of, are you coming to office from nine to six or not? We need to engage them more from a perspective of, this is what you're supposed to deliver. Are you delivering it? How am I rewarding you for that? Let me give you another example because I started hiring for Startup Oil recently and I got to see that in the face of it. A lot of people, and I think a lot of you as HR professionals, especially if you're dealing with tech talent, may be having those uh, challenges as well. A lot of times you reach out to the candidates and they're like, I'm not going to join you full time, but you know, I can take up a project on the side and I can spend about six hours a day. And you get to thinking, what are you going to do with the other company then if you're going to spend six hours a day with me? So that basically means that the accountability of the, comp the companies are still trying to find out how to hold employees accountable on a day-to-day -day basis. Because till now, as HR professionals or as leaders, our accountability was attendance. Our accountability is everybody's coming to office, they're working nine to six, so they're probably doing their job. If they're staying over time, so probably their productivity is higher, right? So that mindset was always there at the back, no matter how much we spoke about KPIs, OKRs, you know, we are build, building our, our, our everything on productivity. So now it is becoming all the more important to hold people responsible for the job they're doing and also rewarding them for that, also acknowledging them for that. Because acknowledgement has become really important now since you may not be able to meet these people face to face every day. The second trend that is obviously emerging, which I saw clearly and blatantly, particularly in the Vietnam market, is people wanting to work in a multinational environment, people wanting to get exposure to the global environment as well. Young people, Generation Z, the first question you ask them, why do you want to join us, whether I was working with Tiki or whether I'm working with Stratapoi or whether I'm helping somebody hire for them. The first answer is, I want to meet people outside of just what I know. I want to interact more with people outside because everything is going to become global eventually. There will be nothing called Vietnam. There will be nothing called India or North America. Everything, especially the tech practices, are going to go global. So a lot more people are wanting to be able to touch base with everybody mm. in a common language. So that is a very recent trend which I've seen, which I did not see it in the past, where people are more comfortable I don't know if I want to work with you guys because I am more comfortable just in my own language and culture. So that's changing. It's becoming more globalized. So those are the very positive trends which, 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 which basically emerged last year, most because we were all sitting at home for six months, locked at home, still trying to make things work. Uh, and uh, it has gone a lot in a positive direction. 
in the negative direction, I would say is something where people need to be more focused on their mental health. That's something which we don't acknowledge a lot. Sometimes mental health is something which we just think, uh, I'm just not happy. We don't acknowledge that that's something which needs to be taken care of. And I think that trend is emerging a lot in Vietnam as well, where the young people are starting to talk about it. I had never heard this before. I had never heard this like three years ago or two years ago. Now people have started acknowledging that mental health is as important as physical health, so that awareness is coming. We have a long way to go in that, but as thing, I think as organizations, we need to take the first step in acknowledging it and making sure that our employees also acknowledge that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Sakshi. Let me provide a different perspective. We, we just celebrated our 30th anniversary at Heineken Vietnam, so we're definitely not a startup. Within Heineken, still relatively young. But I think to the, to the corporate world, the new way of working or the future of work was introduced with a bang, obviously, by COVID. And especially in Vietnam, this was last year. We had a bit of a warm-up in 2020. But last year, the long lockdown really shifted uh, and changed the way we work. And this is irreversible. And I think it's exciting. Also for us, we have six breweries, 11 offices, three and a half thousand employees. How can we all shift to this new way of working? But when I think when COVID kicked in really last year, we focused as a management first on two things, communication and care. Me, planning meetings online is not so difficult, but how do you have, how do you make up for the small chit chats, the small informal information exchanges in the office that are all of a sudden uh, gone or replaced by endless stream of, of video calls. So for example, as a management team, we install daily scrums, 30 minutes, just checking in what's going on, not only on the business level, also on the personal level. Uh, and then the notion of care, I think Sakshi, you already mentioned it. Uh, care is not only getting your people, keeping your people safe from COVID, uh, arranging vaccinations, which we all did, but it's also about the mental health. The conditions in which people are now working are no longer directly visible for us. Um, and it's the blurring of work and personal life uh, might have felt good at the start, like, oh my God, I got so much freedom. But in the end, there's no beginning and the end of work. Your laptop is always around you. Your office papers are always around you. So that is a whole new notion that we need to take care of. Uh, for us, it was particularly challenging. We have like three groups of, of, of colleagues uh, we have our six breweries. Well, a brewery is, is a special factory. You can't switch off. It takes us four weeks to brew a Heineken. Once it's brewed, it needs to be cared for for four weeks. So when the government started to impose all these restrictions, we had people staying on site, the famous three on site, for three months. I mean, the resilience, the commitment there is just mind-blowing and humbling. Then we had our sales force who, living at one of our company values, passion for our consumers and customers. How can you express that passion if you can no longer visit all the outlets and all our customers? So all of that had to be shifted uh, by phone because you don't meet a customer in a Microsoft Teams meeting. So that, that was a whole shift for that second group. And the third group, obviously, the, obvi the, the more office staff that, that went more on, on the endless streams of, of Teams meetings. Then you have the older generations, which is also very interesting. I think startups are heavily skewed towards millennials, Gen Z. We have the mix. We have 30% we have, um, of our workforce is below, below uh, 30 years. Um, but, but we have also people who have been with us for 30 years. And, and for all of them, this is quite different. So we need to be very agile, very responsive and stay in touch. I think that is key in the future of work. How do you stay in touch? Right, um, thank you, Alex. Under um, the scope of a venture capitalist, I would love to share you know, a couple of story of my portfolio companies who received seed funding early 2021, right after you know, the lockdown, all the craziness happened in Vietnam. So before that lockdown, they received the seed funding and they expected to grow to scale really aggressively in 2021, right? Not knowing we will have a, the, um, the crazy lockdown coming in. Um, and so two of them have to have to deal with uh, have, have to deal with that um, lockdown in a very different way. So one of them is an e-commerce company. Uh, and the employees have to actually live in that warehouse uh, for 
almost three months, uh, not seeing the family for you know three months. They have to do like all that uh, leave and and work and kind of camp in that warehouse. So the the big team that we are seeing uh, from that experience is you know teamwork and organizational value and organize, organizational culture, because if they don't have and if they don't work with the people who trust and care for one another and without that psychologically safety, um, I think it would be impossible for the team to stick together and live together in, in that warehouse and, you know, not seeing their, we have one founder who did not see their newborn for the last two months uh, because he has to stay and work in that warehouse. Um, and the second one is organizational value. Uh, if they don't feel valued by, you know, and, and don't feel empowered by uh, organizational uh, culture, um, they would not feel the sense of identity and the, the, the sense of distinctive culture uh, that motivate them to stay in that in, in that warehouse for the last uh, three months in during that lockdown period, right? So I, I think a big theme from that um, example of that portfolio companies uh, is to bring out the team elements and bring out the organizational culture and um, cohesive value uh, so that family members uh, during that period, right? So everyone is grieving, everyone is tired. Uh, so if we don't create like a purpose, in a sense of uh, purpose at work, uh, I think it would be really better during that time. Um, the second one, uh, the second example would be another startup company that has to, we have to build like a, a brand new cell uh, team um, and a major team during that, that major challenge because we couldn't go out and meet clients in, a, in, in person uh, and closing sale was extremely difficult. Um, I think what we have learned during that, that experience is how can we inspire, uh, how can we inspire individuals? How can we inspire individuals to create competitive advantage to empower that sales team? Uh, because we, without the, the uh, kind of purpose of how do, we, how do we make money? How do we run the place? Uh, how, do, how do that sell individual create value for the sales team? Uh, it would be really hard to kind of gather that cell team together because everyone was just like working uh, remotely, uh, not being able to meet the client in, in person. Um, so the two main teams that I've seen from my portfolio companies uh, last year in 2021, first of all, is inspiring and giving power, power to individuals. And the second one is to create um, organizational culture values in uh, bringing teamwork, yeah. Awesome, thanks everyone for sharing. I, I noticed that there's a common, there, there's so many things to unpack, but there's one common theme that everyone has sort of brought up, which is about uh, hybrid working and or remote working and the uh, impact that it has on employee experience in general. So you have, um, so it actually affects um, our employees in so many different ways, like for the, for the on-site employees in a different way and for the people who has to work from home or work in a hybrid uh, manner uh, in, in a different way. So could you also elaborate a little bit more on some of the barriers to, to when it comes to employee experience and how what are some of the concrete actions that you have taken to tackle those barriers? I, th I think I like to build on the uh, the purpose that that Valerie brought in. If people are scattered all over the place, it's very important to have that 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 common purpose. Why people make such a big sacrifice in in for example in the three on site in our breweries? Uh, that's a huge sacrifice. Why are people willing to do that? So it's very important to get the purpose right. Funny enough, our Heineken purpose is the joy of true togetherness. Um, which of course is difficult virtual. We had lots of virtual drinks and virtual meetings, but true togetherness, we believe nothing beats, uh, beats that. But um, again, it comes down to communication. So you need to be very intentional in the frequency and how you reach out to your people. It's easy to plan 
a one-on-one -on -one virtually or, or a team meeting for that matter. Uh, but we gather re on, on quite some occasions, the whole organization, three and a half thousand people in town halls. Um, okay, that needs a proper preparation. I wouldn't say a TV studio to present from, but, but even when it was from home, a lot of videos you assemble and that's how you get people engaged and, uh, and motivated. And again, there's so many new opportunities emerging. Uh, true creativity emerges under restrictions. And that's, I think, uh, what you've seen. I've been visiting our breweries, going through the breweries. So this the brewery staff, they take a webcam and they walk me through. Again, it's different. I don't have the sounds and the smells, but, but there's so much cr creativity emerging, so many opportunities for people to still share their passion to what they're doing with their colleagues. And I think that is important to keep, uh, to keep going. Um, maybe this question I'll probably direct it to Valerie, uh, considering that she's heavily involved in the Web, web 2 and Web 3 uh, investment. Um, we talk about the different, the creative way that, our, that company leaders can take to uh, engage employees uh, to make them feel like they are part of a group and to create that organizational culture and values. Um, will there be any sort of um, innovation from the Web 2 and Web 3 in terms of engaging employees in this regard? Yeah, so I, I've been talking to a lot of uh, talents wanting to move from Web 2 to Web 3's world because they see that Web 3 offers a more flexibility, uh, more, you know, remote schedules, uh, you know, because physic, physical workspace and footprint uh, are not going to be anymore. Uh, they are requiring like more long-term remote models. Uh, and kind of, you know, more attention to their well-being and their productivities. Um, so I am seeing more interest from talents uh, to move to Web3 space. And some of the companies are adapting to that as well. So they are like thinking about how can they, how can they make workplace as a metaverse? So like the, some of them are actually thinking about, you know, buying um, the VR headset so that uh, the meeting will not be just like a Zoom meeting anymore. Uh, people will interact with each other on that virtual rea reality. Uh, so, so actually, some of them actually implement that kind of uh, VR meeting and metaverse uh, meeting instead of just a regular Zoom meetings. Um, so it's an exciting trend, but um, you know, yeah, I, I have seen a couple kind of um, uh, innovators uh, that revamp the meeting zoom meeting experience because let's be honest everyone is tired of uh, being on zoom <laughs> like constantly yeah awesome thanks valerie for some of the insights on the uh, technological advancement uh, that is happening right now in the future world um this question i actually want to break it to to sakshi because she actually mentioned uh, the diversity of the future workplace and with diversity there will come a lot of, of opportunities for people to interact, to get to know each other, to understand the different culture, but there will also be some sort of challenge coming from diversity as well. Um, we have the diversity, equity, inclusion as one of the um, key criteria for companies to be more, to become more sustainable nowadays. So um, given the diversity challenges, given your experience in DP, given your experience as a foreigners as well, um, how do you say that the future workplace would deal with those diversity challenge and how would you embrace the strength comes from diversity? You're mute. Sorry, sorry about that. Uh, uh, thank you, Lynn, for, for the question. Uh, I definitely believe that uh, that's going to be a challenge in the future. We will have people working everywhere from every part of the world. I honestly also believe that the future of work will be particularly Gen Z not working for one particular company. They will be working for multiple companies at a time, and that is going to become future of world work. A lot of companies will have to figure out social security systems. So there is a new tech field that is going to emerge in terms of how social security for this population is taken care of. In terms of how do we connect these people to a common culture, to a common value, to a common vision? Uh, personally, I feel it is very important to let people have a voice. So a lot of times we 
organize a lot of things, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's virtual, when we're doing it virtually, where people are just on Zoom and you know there is a Zoom fatigue. And I agree with Valerie, there is a Zoom fatigue. There has to be ways where we encourage people to put in their two cents in some way, whether we encourage them to make some TikTok videos or whether we ask them to like stitch together some birthday videos so that people feel included. It's very important that people are able to also express it's one thing that I'm sitting here addressing my team, giving them the vision, giving them everything, but it's a different thing when I'm asking them to ask me questions. There'll be only two people who'll ask me questions and the rest of everybody's gonna be quiet. So how do we make sure that we are able to let those people also you know, communicate, interact? So that is gonna be really important. Interaction will not just be work-based, so we have to find different ways of making people interact, whether we connect them on common hobbies, whether we connect them on common food, whether we connect them on common travels. So that is something we will have to look into the future to see, since people will not be able to meet, meet each other in person, how are we able to connect them just beyond work? How are we able to connect them on hobbies? Everybody in the world, wherever they are sitting, may have a hobby of boating, or have a hobby of playing chess, or love Korean food, or love Italian food. So how do we make sure that we are able to connect them just beyond work? That is something which will push companies to innovate just beyond that, as well as still tie them to a common vision, as well as still tie to them what the company is doing. So I think communication is going to become very important. And when companies are communicating, they will have to basically look beyond just professional ways of connecting people. They will have to go into the personal aspect of it so that people sitting around the globe in different time zones are able to relate to each other, understand each other's personality beyond work. That's where I see the future of work is going to go. I think there's a lot of a lot of riches in what you say, yes, actually. And it's actually there's so many exciting aspects to this new way of working, if you think about it. So it started with this crisis. So indeed, the Zoom fatigue is, I think, also sparked by Corona fatigue and, and what have you. But if we clean this out to the new way of working, the advantage will be is that we will be working in a way more hybrid way within your country, within your business. But what you say, the world has gone so much smaller. You can now as good interact with colleagues where a multinational hand can obviously all over the world. You just need to pick the right time as you can do with your colleagues here. And that's that's what we've learned in the, in, in the past. Colleagues in, in Amsterdam or South Africa or, or Mexico were far away. Now you just pick the right slot and we are really well trained to interact effectively and personally with, with these colleagues. So it's there's a lot of excitement ahead, I would say, sparked by this bloody virus. But uh, yeah. a lot of good things coming out of it. Yeah. Yeah. Another very important thing which I think will emerge, I would particularly represent tech sector here, is uh, we usually are talking about engineers in Vietnam, the compensation is lower. Or, you know, in India, you find that is going to merge. Eventually, what is going to happen is compensation is going to become standard around the world. It will completely be dependent on skill set. Which will, which will actually force people to keep upskilling themselves. So the competition is going to become a lot more where the competition is not going to be who are the 10 engineers who are sitting with me right now in Vietnam. The competition will be, I have to be on the top in the global engineering community. We also see that's already happening where you know the pay gaps are now becoming closer and closer. So if the pay gap between a Silicon Valley engineer and a Vietnam engineer used to be, I don't know, like 500%, it's probably now really shrinking down to becoming a 50% or a 45% and it's gradually shrinking even more. I personally believe, my belief in the next five years, it will completely depend on what skill set this person has rather than which country this person is based out of or where it is working. That will create a lot more challenge for the Generation Z to upskill themselves continuously if they want to stay relevant in the global workforce. Yeah. And that's a huge opportunity for, for Vietnam. We're, we're gonna, at Heineken, we're going to set up regional hubs so we're going to have a digital digital team here in Vietnam that's going to lead digital transformations in Cambodia and in Indonesia within the region. Same with production. If you can manage a brewery remotely from Vietnam, you can also manage a brewery remotely uh, on technical assistance in, in another country. So you, lots of opportunity for the Vietnamese uh, workforce. Yeah, um, since actually also mentioned uh, about, you know, the conversion of skill, I also would like to bring up a, a new concept, new term that I learned a few weeks ago, uh, proof of skill. 
So before, um, when we hire something, the HR would usually just look at the CV and seeing what the skill set that person lists out in, the, in that CV or resume. Uh, but I think with the um, emergence of Web3s, uh, education technology will have an entirely different phase. Uh, right now, I, I foresee that um, talents, when we they apply to jobs, um, they would have to show the proof of skill. So like how recent uh, it is to, they, they acquire this particular skill and you know, they would got, got that certificate um, maybe on the blockchain or on the tokens or by uh, uh, NFT certification to show that this is something they recently acquired um, and not like a, a course or a class that they learned five years ago and they just put it down on their paper CV. Uh, so I think proof of skill um, would be a new concept that HR uh, would look for when they hire new talents. Thanks everyone for the great, great discussion and sharing recently. Um, this actually leads perfectly to the next question. With all these trends coming in, with all this, uh, all the um, impacts from 2021, the virtual, uh, the future of work in 2021, what is your forecast or expectation of the future of your own organization in 2022? Specifically, any trends that you want to keep in the next years to come, any, anything that you want to resolve, hopefully resolve in the next year to come, and how would you mitigate or adapt to those challenges? Yeah, I can start. Um, okay, so since I, I just started the company, right, so I am building something which is going to be the future of work where we think that it's going to be a work and play model. It's not going to be just work. It's going to be everything when ESO, like Valerie said, when recruiters are actually hiring. I don't think they're just going to now start looking at only what you've done in your CV. They would want to know the personality of a person. So it will become more of a work and play because probably you will never meet this person and you will probably be working with this person remotely. So the or companies are going to go more on that. The challenge which I see, which will be coming for all of us, is going to be that the Generation Z will not be satisfied just working with one company. They will not be satisfied just working on one project. They will want to do a lot more. They, I see a future where people will be working with Facebook and Amazon together. They'll just be working on projects. They'll be doing it together. So the challenge I see as a part of the organization is how do we manage that workforce? How do we keep them motivated? How do we make sure that we are able to uh, keep them engaged at the same time, also get the best out of everybody. How do we make sure we are upskilling? So we are talking a completely different game, I feel, in the next coming two to five years where we have to engage people in a completely different way and we have to be completely okay for them to be doing multiple jobs, working in different countries, different companies, different cultures, and uh, probably never meeting them, probably just doing everything online. So how do we manage that? I don't have an answer to that because the answer will evolve. The answer will evolve with technology, whether it is through, I don't know, virtual, whether we will do something which new tools will come up, but we will have to manage how we are going to build our work around this trend. Uh, you already see that. I think most of you would be seeing that happening already where Generation Z is pretty much like, I want to do this also, I want to do that also, and I want to do this also. Plus, I want to focus on my work-life balance. Plus, I want to focus on my mental health, right? So how do we manage all that and put it all in what we are planning for the future for our, for our, for our companies? How do we do that? We have to do things very differently. So that's something which sometimes keeps me awake on how do we do that? Because we are in this stage, it's going to change very fast. It's probably just three to six months away where we'll suddenly wake up and say, 50% of the workforce wants to do this and we are not ready. So, so yeah. Yeah, we, we actually opened our new head office last Wednesday, which is completely laid out to this new way of working. For those interested, you can find some pictures on, on LinkedIn. Uh, it's, it's really a revolution. We took out all the cubicles, all the offices. It's all open space, breakout rooms. Uh, it looks super exciting. Uh, but besides, the, let's say, the hardware, the office, which now looks nice, and there is this way of working that we needed to align on. So we, we assembled a team of, of, of respected and representative colleagues of generations and, and departments, and we asked them. So once we reopen the new office, we all come back to work. How do you guys want to work? Please tell us, the management team, how we should do that. And they actually came with a proposal, minimum two days in the office. Wednesday, we're all in for the, the joy of true togetherness. And then the other three days is basically work from anywhere. 
So I, I, honestly, personally, I was obviously in, inspired by this, but I had a mind like we just made this really nice office. If that's going to be only two days, people inside it's going to be a huge empty space. So I was a bit concerned when I said, okay, if we if we empower our teams to propose, we need to follow what they say. So we're now in this, we just started this new way of working two days in the office minimum and, and three days from anywhere. I already see the office looks so exciting. Everybody's in four to five days, but, but it is really uh, important to give them the, the freedom. What I think will be critical, let's say, or, or, or a more of a challenge, at, at least let's say from us, from the corporate world, COVID really forced us to leapfrog into this new way of working. For, for a startup, I think you guys emerged from that and you have also high representation of the new generation. The freedom that we are now giving to the whole organization and the responsibility that we delegate, the managers in our organization, and, and if this pilot in Ho Chi Minh City head office is successful, we're gonna roll this out over all 11 offices, is how do you how do you guide your team on this? There will be people who maybe are not comfortable with the freedom or who maybe abuse the freedom, if I look at it more negatively. So we need to train and guide and coach our managers on to steer their teams on how to do hybrid right. And actually, I can I don't know if the background shows me this, but there's a very interesting article in the Harvard Business Review on doing business uh, right. You can find it online, it's for free. Also funny notion of the dress code that obviously changed. This is a very recognizable picture for me. I tend to wear, if ever I wear a suit, it's only half my suit these days. But uh, so there's a lot of, I think it's important with all the freedom that we give that we also define a bit the rules of the game. So how do we want to work? How do we protect our company culture? There need to be some togetherness, some real togetherness to protect that. So. I'm all for freedom. I'm super excited by this new way of working. Uh, the new office gives me a huge inspiration, but we do this to boost employee happiness and to boost productivity. If productivity drops by this way of working, then of course we, we have a bit of a challenge. So that, that needs some, some guidance and learning and adjusting on the way, I would guess. Yeah, for me, um, 2022, what's going to be the main theme, I think, will be majorly empower, employee empowerment. And empowering here doesn't mean like leaving them alone or, or you know, not um, like hoping that they will rise uh, without any uh, directions. I think empowerment here um, would require more involvement, uh, not less, but empower, empowering here, meaning like give them uh, feedback and give them room to kind of showcase and um, hi highlight their, their strength uh, and focusing on articulating the nature of work. Uh, I think we will constantly have to question, re-question ourselves. Uh, what's the purpose of our organization? Uh, how do we make money? Uh, how, what's the agenda and how to deliver on this? Um, how do we make money questions, right? So sustaining the core value of the business, of the startup missions. Um, so focus on that mission long-term uh, to de generate the value that the startup or the company is pursuing. Uh, and the second one would be how work gets done. Um, whether that be, you know, the VR meetings, building the metaverse, uh, or, you know, doing, if we have to camp in the warehouse for two months, uh, if that, how, gets done, then, then we, would, we would stick to it. Um, so I think the biggest two questions would be, how do we make money and how do, how do we get works done? Um, so uh, uh, evolving um, to empower our employees. Yeah. Thanks everyone for all the great sharing. I hope that I have more questions to more and more time to talk to you, but it's time to, uh, for, for the q and it's time for some audience member to speak up and to ask you some questions. Uh, we have we actually have a lot of questions queue up and audience feel free to turn on your mic or raise your hand and then i'll call on the person to ask the question i believe dan also has a question for us so maybe let's begin with dan dan can you quickly turn on your camera and talk done 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 yes well first of all uh thanks uh, everyone here valerie and sakshi and alex for the uh, incredibly insightful sharing so in the back end i'm 
WhatsApping with a couple of team members saying, you see, we're totally on the right track. You see, the experts are saying that this is where we're heading. That's great. Um, and, you know, like in what we do day to day, right, we see a couple of really important elements to making, you know, workplaces and work experiences work. So that's obviously at the core, again, is uh, space. You know, we have hospitality as a really important point, the feeling that you belong somewhere, the feeling that someone cares about you. Uh, engagement, right? So again, is there always something new that people have a reason to come back to the office, even if it's the most beautiful office in the world? Is it still fun and interesting three, four months after launching or after joining? And then obviously the technology that facilitates all of that. So I'm going to ask a little bit of a challenging question maybe, which is that engage, the engagement part typically, if, if it was done at all, it was typically done by uh, HR, maybe not always the most senior HR person. So engage, the engagement part of an office, right? Thinking about Gen Zs who will have an attention span of six seconds. I think that's the average TikTok uh, as they're scrolling through their feed. If the office has to be more like a TikTok feed, who owns engagement in, in the company of the future? I think that's that's the whole team. Um, what I, when, I, when we launched the new office, I told the, I told the team, I said, guys, this is our new house. We all live in this place together. Uh, we're going to move to a new way of working. So just like a normal family, we all need to define the rules of how we want to work in this new place, how we want to live in this new house together. And that's how I would like to see it. It needs to be a place where the rules not are set by management because the, the future of work is way less hierarchical and top down. It needs to be a place where we all agree on how we, we're going to keep this an inspiring place and a pleasant place to come to and work. That, that's how I would like to see it. Everyone. Everyone. Shared mission. Yeah. Uh, I would just add to that, that it completely depends on uh, how, the seed, how the leaders want to cascade it. We, ca we can say we want Generation uh, Z to own it. Everybody wants to own it but it is ultimately how these leaders are going to cascade it. So we've seen examples of all in all companies, right? There are times when only HR owns it. There are times when only admin owns it. There are times when everybody owns it. There is time when only senior leaders own it. So it completely depends on as leaders, how do you want that to cascade in your organization? The ideal scenario for Don, you could be that we want, or for Alex, you could be that you want everybody to own it. But an ideal scenario for another company in the world would be we as leaders want to own everything and we want to control it, right? Yeah. So I, I still think that that ideal scenario is not going to change. Companies are not going to follow that. Everybody's going to do how they think it needs to be run. Honestly, it is personal depend, opinion dependent. I feel that the culture should be owned by people who are really responsible for the culture. So I would rather have my generation Z own it fully because they know what they want and they can do it in a much better way than I could. For, for example, let's take an example. We are all in Vietnam. New Year party is a very big thing, right? Uh, what do you want from a New Year party? You usually tell your Generation Z to plan it because you know that that's what they will do what they want to do. But if I start planning it, I'm probably going to make it completely different, right? So it's completely dependent on how the leaders want to run it, how they want to do it. And I think that is not going to change. That's going to still sustain where every organization will have its own way of doing it and running it. So now you know why we are 90% Gen Z in the company, right? Because if yeah. someone is going to design the workplace for those Absolutely. employees, it has to be it has to be people that get it and not from a sort of theoretical, you know, like I can research what does Gen Z like, but it's not it's not going to be good, right? It's just an old guy trying to <laughs> trying to be young. So, yeah, that's why we have all these Gen Zers as you can see on the on the video panel here. But but we we often discuss uh, inclusion and diversity. That's not a hot at least corporate or global topic. Mm. For us in Vietnam, IND is, or Heineken Vietnam, is not about, not so much about gender. Uh, I think there we're doing a pretty good job. We have half the breweries run by women, but it's way more about generation mm. inclusion and diversity because Gen Z is there and how they want to work is very different and it's loud and clear. But we still also have the millennials and, 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 and the older generation. So, and all, we're all part of this workforce. So, we, we need to define a way of working again that works for all these generations. Of course, we get a lot of inspiration. If you don't own the future, uh, then, then, then you're gonna be short-lived, but it has to be working for all generations. So that's why 
I prefer to say that 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 the, the culture, the way we interact and work in the office is owned by the staff. Of course, this is freedom within a framework. You have the culture, which is the framework. It, it's it's your business, your mission, your your strategy, which provides a framework, and management is responsible for that. But within that, uh, yeah, let everybody feel mm. empowered to contribute. Beautiful note, yeah. Thank you, Dan, for the great questions. And thanks, everyone, for the answer. Um, we have time for one more question. And we actually have two more. So um, yes, I'm going to, this question is probably directing to Valerie. How do you see Web3 innovating HR operations in different companies in the future? Yeah, uh, excellent. I think the first um, kind of division that, that is going to be affected by Web3 or um, empowered by Web3 is learning and, and development. So before employee training, company training was sort of, you know, very uh, kind of a must tool that everyone feel like they have to do it. Um, I don't feel when I was back in my corporate job, I don't, I don't feel like I am excited about a new training coming up or like a new task that I have to do for um, getting like CPE, which is a certificate um, uh, score to, to, to get my professional license. Uh, I think Web3 is going to change entirely all of that. Uh, learning and development in corporate will change entirely uh, because now um, I think there will be like more peer-to-peer peer, peer, -peer interaction in L&D. Uh, there will be like more real-time recognition and more real-time certification uh, using blockchain technology that will require, you know, proof of skill, proof of uh, attendance protocol uh, that would require them to be physically there uh, and, and not just, you know, skipping through the recorded lectures uh, to get that credit, that certificate to, to get... Um, um, to, to pass that learning and development. So I think the most important and, and the biggest uh, uh, change in HR operation would be learning and development. Awesome. Thank you, Valerie, for your answers. And thanks, thanks to all our panelists for joining the panel discussion today. I know we still have a lot of questions to go through, but um, hopefully that if, 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 if you allow, um, it'd be great if some of some of the participants can actually email you and ask you the question directly, if that's possible. Um, thanks everyone for, for joining today. And let's move on to the next part of the ceremony, which is the final ceremony. Thanks everyone.